Hey, let's uh, open with a prayer and get started here. Father, you are uh, a wonderful blessing to us, a living person and a, and a, a great majestic king. Pray that you would uh, speak your words among us tonight and uh, speak your words through us tonight. And uh, open our ears to hear, open our eyes to see uh, what you are communicating with us in your word tonight. Amen. So I've been going through, uh, going further with uh, Matthew, looking at the uh, places where it, it refers back to the writings of Moses. And so we're up to chapter 9 so far. Um, some people brought to him a paralyzed man on a mat. Seeing their faith, Jesus said to the paralyzed man, Be encouraged, my child, your sins are forgiven. But some of the teachers of religious law said to themselves, That's blasphemy. Does he think he's God? Jesus knew what they were thinking. So he asked them, Why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? So, um... This was cross-referenced to Genesis 6 at the time of Noah, uh, where he said um, God was uh, recognizing that every imagination of the thoughts of their hearts was only evil continually. Um, so um, this could, you know, could be a uh, reference back to that. Why do you have such evil thoughts in your hearts? Um I was kind of interested that in in Matthew he didn't mention the whole thing about tearing up the roof and lowering the lowering the man down. <laughs> he left all that part of the story out. Just said they brought him brought him a paralyzed man on a mat. Um, okay, then in chapter uh, chapter nine verse twenty, just then a woman who had suffered for twelve years with constant bleeding came up behind him. She touched the fringe of his robe. So this is while he was walking with this huge crowd over to the, I think it was the synagogue ruler's uh, house because his daughter um, was uh, had just died or or uh, was was very sick, and uh, this woman came up in the crowd and touched the fringe of his robe. Um, so in Leviticus fifteen twenty five is where it says that a woman with a, a flow of blood is unclean if her Flow of blood lasts a long time. Uh, she continues to be unclean. And then in Numbers 15 and uh, Deuteronomy 22, it talks about the tassels. And here you see a prayer shawl that has tassels on the end of it. Uh, down here. Uh, to remind the people of Israel about the commandments and that they should uh, live live according to the commandments. And so she she somehow uh, thought that if she could touch that fringe on the on the Lord's garment, if it was his robe or his prayer shawl or whatever, uh, if she could just touch that fringe, she thought she'd be healed. And uh, um, so he commended her for that, that faith that she had. And in verse 36, uh, when he saw the crowds, he had compassion on them because they were confused and helpless like sheep without a shepherd. He said to his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. So pray to the Lord who is in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. So, um, in Numbers chapter 27, uh, Moses is praying for a new leader because God had just told him, you're going to go up the mountain, you're going to see the good land, and then you're going to die. You're not going into this good land. Um, so Moses prays for a new leader, and that's when God told him, you need to appoint Joshua or Yeshua 
and you need to um, put some of your honor on him so that people will follow him and he'll be the leader into the into the good land. So here, uh, Yeshua, um, the Lord, is, is telling his disciples, the harvest is great, but the workers are few. Pray to the Lord who's in charge of the harvest. Ask him to send more workers into his fields. Um, so he, he's asking them to, to be Moses and pray for a new leader. Pray for more. Um, you know, I've heard in, in, in uh, interpreted that here they were um, to pray for the for for the workers, and then in the in the very beginning of the next you know verse or two in chapter ten, the Lord sends them out uh, in, into His fields as workers. So they were you know the, it was interpreted that if you ask the Lord for for uh, more workers, He'll send you. Which you know I don't <laughs> I don't say that's wrong, but but it seems like um, there's also the the part here he's telling them they are the workers and they need to ask for more workers. Uh, so it's not not enough to uh, go out and do the work, but we need to be finding you know raising up more workers who can do the work after us together with us and then after us. Uh, all right, I'm going to look up Numbers 27 here because. I'm wondering if this thing about sheep without a shepherd is in there. If uh, Oh, yeah. So when Moses is praying, he says, May the Lord, the God of the spirits of all flesh, appoint a man over the congregation who will go out and come in before them and who will lead them out and bring them in, that the congregation of the Lord may not be like sheep which have no shepherd. Okay. So he is definitely uh, referring to back to Moses here. He says he saw the crowds like sheep without a shepherd and told his disciples to pray for, for workers. So he's um there's definitely a reference to Moses' prayer that you would he would send out a leader, a new leader, uh, so that Israel would not be like sheep without a shepherd. Okay, then in chapter 10, uh, verse 15, I tell you the truth. This is uh, Yeshua speaking. I tell you the truth, the wicked cities of Sodom and Gomorrah will be better off than such a town on the judgment day. So he's rebuking the cities that he had uh, done miracles in, um, that they hadn't repented. Uh, that that um, Sodom and Gomorrah would have repented if they had seen the miracles he just did in their time in those towns. Um, and he also, I, I think, in the process of rebuking some of the cities, he referred back to uh, let's see, oh, to uh, Jonah, yeah, and that the um, they would have like Nineveh repented, and he didn't do the judgment on that town. Um, so that's he says if if he would have done. If anyone, if God would have sent miracles in uh, Sodom and Gomorrah, they would have repented. He wouldn't have had to destroy them. So you look back in Genesis 18. Uh, it's when the Lord tells Abraham about Sodom and that he's going to go down there and see if it's as bad as he's been hearing. And, uh, um, and then in chapter 19, the angels go down there and uh, rescue Lot and his family. Except his sons-in-law, as was it his, yeah, sons-in-law, the ones who were supposed to marry his daughters, just laughed when he told them that the city was about to be destroyed by God, and they didn't, they didn't uh, believe him. So the angels just took Lot and his wife and his two daughters and brought them out, um, uh, out of the destruction. And then, uh, you know, you can read the whole story there, in chapter nineteen. So referring back to that in uh, Genesis, the stories in Genesis, um, when he's uh, rebuking these cities that didn't repent. Okay, and the next verse 16, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. 
So be as shrewd as snakes and harmless as doves. So um, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, you see that the, the, the snake was the most uh, shrewd of all the beasts of the field. And that's the one that, um, that uh, Satan used to deceive the woman. And then uh, in chapter 8 of Genesis, uh, you can see where um, Noah released a dove from the ark. And the first time he released it, it couldn't find any place to set its foot down. Um, and so it came back to the ark. It, the, the ground wasn't dry enough yet. It couldn't find a place. Uh, um, and if you ever watch, uh, you know, pigeons or doves, you know, they'll circle around, circle around, looking for just the right spot to to perch. Um, if they don't find it, they'll just fly away. If they do find it, then they'll, you know, after they circle a couple of times, they'll they'll rest there. So doves are like that. They, uh, <laughs> if they don't find the right place to put their foot down, they'll just fly back where they came from, I guess. Um in chapter 11, John the Baptist, who was in prison, heard about all the things the Messiah was doing. So he sent his disciples to ask Jesus, are you the Messiah we've been expecting, or should we keep looking for someone else? Um, so the cross-reference given for this was in Genesis 49, verse 10. Uh, this is where uh, Jacob is blessing his sons before his death. Um, and he, he's, his blessing to Judah says that Judah was going to rule until Shiloh comes. And there is no other place in the uh, old in the Hebrew scriptures where this this name Shiloh shows up. Only in this blessing to Judah. Um, so it's hard to <laughs> take all the other uses of it, all the other occasions where it's where it's put into the verse, and and compare them and see what you know what it's referring to in all the other places, because there are no other places. Um, but uh, anyway, they cross-referenced it back to there. He says, are you the one who's coming? Are we looking for someone else? So they're saying Judah is going to rule until Shiloh comes. Um, so the, anyway, the ones who made those cross-references uh, referred John's question to that, um, you know, to Shiloh coming. To are you the, the that Shiloh was going to be the Messiah? And uh, so he's kind of challenging um, Yeshua to prove he's the Messiah and get him out of prison. Um, but if you keep reading in chapter 11, that's that wasn't, uh, you know, the, the Yeshua only did what the Father did and what the Father told him to do, and that wasn't part of it. So uh, John, but he did encourage John not to lose heart and, and to be steadfast. Okay, in verse 25, at that time, Jesus prayed this prayer, O Father, Lord of heaven and earth, Thank you for hiding these things from those who think themselves wise and clever and for revealing them to the childlike. So he's um, uh, I forget if he was rebuking somebody or uh, somebody, you know, some some people were not receiving his message. And uh, so he praises the father that all these great ones and wise ones aren't getting his message, but these uh, children or these childlike ones are are receiving it. Uh, so Lord of heaven and earth is the title uh, or a similar title is what Melchizedek and Abram address to God. They call him the, um, the Kana of heaven and earth. Kana is like the name Cain, uh, which um, his mother said, uh, I have gotten a man from the Lord. Um, so it's a, a gain or a, or a um, possession. So 
Usually that word means a buyer or a redeemer. Uh, and in only a few places, it could be interpreted as a creator. And this is these are a couple of the places where it says, the, you know, the creator of heaven and earth or the redeemer of heaven and earth or the possessor of heaven and earth. Um, so when he's referring to Lord of heaven and earth, it, it might... Uh, uh, very well, it might very well have re reminded people of when Melchizedek uh, came out to meet Abram after he fought for Lot and rescued him from the from the kings that had uh, fought against Sodom. I notice this is in Genesis 14. That's before uh, Sodom was destroyed in in uh, chapter 19. Okay. Uh, going into chapter 12, at about that time, Jesus was walking through some grain fields on the Sabbath. His disciples were hungry, so they began breaking off some heads of grain and eating them. But some Pharisees saw them do it and protested, Look, your disciples are breaking the law by harvesting grain on the Sabbath. Okay, now, uh, in uh, De Deuteronomy 23 and Leviticus 25, you can see there's a difference between eating and harvesting. And here... You know, if you're eating a little bit, it means you stick your hand out there, you grab, you know, the, the head of grain off of one stalk, and you rub it in your hands and blow off the chaff, and then you eat the grains. Okay? That is just eating a little bit, and you are allowed to do that. You can go into somebody's grain field and eat as much as, you know, <laughs> is all you can eat is fine. Um, you can go into their vineyard, and you can eat all the grapes you want to eat, long as you don't start bagging them and taking them home, okay? Now, if you look uh, on the right side here, these guys are harvesting wheat, and they have a sickle there. You see they're cutting it down uh, in bunches and stacking, uh, you know, tying it together into bunches and leaving it out there to dry. Um, that is harvesting. That is, not, <laughs> that is not eating. That is, you know, they're taking down the whole field, you know, only the farmer should be doing that, not not just some some hungry guy walking by. Uh, if you're a hungry guy walking by, you're allowed in the law of Moses, you know, to grab some with your hands and eat it. That's not harvesting. OK, so um, now apparently, you know, as Fig uh, told us uh, maybe last week or the week before, um, you are allowed. You, they, they put a fence around that. They said, OK. You're not supposed to harvest on the Sabbath, so don't even go and take any. Don't even go and take any with your hand. And and you notice that Jesus is not the one who did that. Uh, and they're not, and they never even um, accused him of that. They said, "Look, look, your disciples are breaking the law." Uh, so I don't know. I, I Jesus was able to wait forty days before he ate his next meal one time. Um, so he got hungry on the Sabbath, and he didn't even didn't even do um, what the law allowed. He he even uh, kept the uh, the tradition they had of not even eating out of a out of a grain field on the Sabbath. Uh, his disciples um, just you know took some to eat. They didn't break the law, but they did break the uh, the tradition. So that's what the Pharisees were complaining about. Um, so in Exodus chapter 20, verse 10, this is one of the Ten Commandments there. No work at all to be done on the Shabbat. Uh, uh, you are allowed to eat. So <laughs> they, Jesus said you, you shouldn't have condemned the innocent here. Uh, all the, you know. Okay. Then I think there's more about this. Yeah, verses 3 and 4. Jesus said to them, haven't you read in the Scriptures what David did when he and his companions were hungry. He went into the house of God, and he, of his, he and his companions broke the law by eating the sacred loaves of bread that only the priests are allowed to eat. So if this, uh, this is in the book of Samuel, where David did this. I give you the reference here. That's not exactly the law of Moses, which is what we're trying to reference here. Um, but I just show you where to look up the story. But Exodus 25 is where... Moses got the, the plan. God gave him the plan for the, the, the table, for the showbread in the, in the tabernacle. 
and they, they were supposed to put bread on there. So if you look at verse 30, it talks about putting bread on that table. And if you look in Leviticus chapter 24, you see that the bread is in the tabernacle. It is for the priests to, to eat. When they, when they eat the meat from the sacrifices, they also eat the bread that's in the tabernacle. Only the priests, nobody else. So um, David went in there and, and the priest gave him the bread that they were taking away. It was, uh, I think it was the Sabbath or, or whatever it was the day when they were supposed to make new loaves and put it on the table and take away the old ones. Um, so he gave David the old ones, uh, which was, you know, against the law. The only priest should have eaten that. Um, he, uh, but, you know, there was, there was a, um, what do you call that, an extenuating circumstance or something? There's a kind of a, uh, you know, David was out there doing the king's business. Uh, actually, he was hiding from the king who was trying to kill him, but um, he, he, you know, he was the king's number one captain or general. Um, and so, the, and as far as the priest knew, he was, he was working for the king and he gave him the bread to uh, feed his hungry men. And, uh, you know, there was no punishment or word from God against that. Uh, they, you know, when he gave the priest bread to the soldiers, um, God didn't condemn the priest for that. Okay, and then verse 5, And haven't you read in the law of Moses that the priest on duty in the temple may work on the Sabbath? Um so if you look in Numbers chapter 28, Moses had the uh, commandment there about the burnt offering. It had to be given on the, on the Shabbat. There is no day off for the priest offering the burnt offering. There's a daily burnt offering uh, every morning and every evening. And uh, on the Shabbat, it has to be offered. Um, and I'm not sure if maybe the one he was talking about here was an extra one besides the daily one. Um, so uh, the priests on duty in the temple may work on the Shabbat. So, you know, uh, these, these disciples, they're, you know, here, here's somebody who's greater than the temple. Um, the Lord uh, Yeshua, greater than the temple, and they're working for him. So, that, you know, even if they were working, <laughs> doing his work, uh, they shouldn't be condemned for doing it on the Shabbat. Um, and then he answered, if you had a sheep that fell into a well on the Sabbath, wouldn't you work to pull it out? Of course you would. And how much more valuable is a person than a sheep? Okay, so this one is not about the, the uh, grain anymore. This is about somebody, they asked him if it was if it was lawful to heal on the Sabbath. He came into the synagogue and it, they had somebody in there who was crippled, I think, and uh, asked him if it was lawful to heal. So he asked them about, you know, if your sheep fell in a well on the Sabbath, you'd, you'd pull it out. Uh, you wouldn't just let that sheep drown in there or, or suffer in there until the next day. Um, so he says, yes, the law permits a person to do good on the Sabbath. So... Uh, this could be referring back to uh, Deuteronomy 22, verse 4, where if you see a neighbor and his, his donkey or his ox is, has um, collapsed on the road, don't just walk by. you gotta, you got to stop and help him get his donkey up or get his ox back up. Um, so he could be, they, they had to lift that donkey or ox. So uh, lifting a sheep out of the well might, might be might be a reminder of this law in Deuteronomy. Okay, then going into chapter 13, this is where he gives several um, parables. And this is the parable of the, the seed and the sower. And when he says, still other seeds fell on fertile soil, and they produced a crop that was 30, 60, and even 100 times as much as had been planted. And this could be referring back to Genesis 26, in verse 12, it says, Isaac harvested 
100, 100 times as much as he planted that year um, in a certain place where he was living at the time because the Lord blessed him. So uh, this seed, under the Lord's blessing, it could produce as much as 100 times as much as what you put in the ground in the spring. Okay, so that was a, you know, that was a parable. It wasn't talking about seeds, but um, the hundredfold produce could could be referring to Genesis. And then verse thirteen and fourteen. That's why I okay. Here he's explaining to his disciples why he uses parables. But they look, but they don't really see. They hear, but they they don't really listen or understand. This fulfills the prophecy of Isaiah that says, when you hear what I say, you will not understand. When you see what I do, you will not comprehend. So in Deuteronomy 29, verse 4, you can see that um, uh, Moses is, I think he's uh, rebuking the people there, people of Israel there. You don't have eyes to see or ears to hear. Or he might be prophesying of a time when that was going to happen. Uh, so I'm not sure if he's rebuking them at, at that time or or prophesying of a future time. Uh, Isaiah is the one who um, that that uh, Yeshua was, was quoting here uh, to his disciples. Um, you can look in several places in Isaiah where he talks about, uh, like when he was commissioned in verse six in, in chapter six, um, he offered to go when God said, "Who will go for us?" And he said, "I'm." Uh, here am I, send me. And, and God told him, okay, you go um, and make this people's eyes blind, make their ears deaf, make their heart uh, hard so they won't see or hear or understand the word of God. So that was what <laughs> Isaiah was going to go out. He'd be speaking the word of God and nobody would get it. In chapter 29, uh, there's, I'm not sure which, you know, who that was referring to, but in chapter 44, he's talking about idol worshipers. They have, they don't have any eyes to see or ears to hear. Uh, so there are different places where Isaiah refers to this kind of thing. Uh, I, I didn't find one where it exactly sounded like the quote that was here, but anyway, anyway he did prophesy similar things several times. And um, it's pretty similar to what Moses said in Deuteronomy. So that's why I included this here. Okay, in uh, verse 33, another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Okay, so in Leviticus chapter 2, Speaking of the grain offering, no grain offering can have yeast. They're going to they're make different kinds of cakes and um, breads and stuff, but you can't put in yeast uh, if it's going to be a grain offering. Uh, then in Genesis 18, this is a time when God and, and uh, two angels walked into Abraham's camp and... Um, and Abraham saw him and ran over and said, you know, could you could you just sit down uh, and let me get some food ready for you? He sent Sarah to, to prepare three measures of flour and uh, hurry up and knead it up into and make bread to set before these visitors. So this is, you know, just a few after he fed them, then uh, God told him about uh, Sodom and a few other things that he wanted to tell Abraham. Um, he, he he just said, "I can't hide this thing from Abraham. He's a uh, he's gonna his family is he's gonna teach his family to obey my commandments. Uh, can I really hide what I'm about to do in Sodom from him?" So um, Abraham meant that much to God, and he went and visited him personally. Uh, in the flesh, and even sat down and ate a meal that Abraham made for him. Um, and so anyway, the, the, when Sarah, when the instructions he gave Sarah were to get three measures of flour. So here in this parable, 
Yeshua also says uh, this woman puts yeast in three measures of flour and, and, and leavens all the dough with just that little bit of yeast. Okay, and the thing in Leviticus tells you that no grain offering ever ever can have yeast. So yeast is is not something that's, there's no place where, you know, yeast is a um, positive, has a positive meaning. Um, uh, he doesn't tell Sarah to, to put yeast in the bread. Um, he just tells her to use three measures of flour. And since she had to make it fast, she probably didn't put any yeast in there because that takes a couple hours for it to rise. Um, but, you know, but that, that wasn't really mentioning yeast. But uh, here he's saying that she's putting yeast in the bread. Uh, there is no place where yeast has a positive interpretation. It's, you know, and in Leviticus is the first place where it says, do not put yeast in any of your grain offerings. So that that has to be uh, taken into account when you're um, interpreting this this parable. Uh, I even read one one uh, commentary that said this is the only place in Scripture where yeast is positive, which <laughs> which proves that he did enough research to know that yeast is not positive, and he should have stuck with uh, the rest of the scriptures when he interpreted this one. Okay, so that's as far as I got. Um, All right, so let's hear what uh, what you got out of the uh, this uh, presentation here. Or any questions you might have. Brother Steve Einstein, I'll can you hear me? You know, I didn't know that Lot had two son in law that were destroyed and Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed. You know, and and I'm trying to wonder why they didn't they didn't believe the angels when they told them that they were gonna destroy the city? Or what what were they problem what were they reading for not leaving, you know? Uh, the angels told Joe, uh, told uh, Lot to go get all his family, uh, whoever was in his family, and so it was Lot who talked to them, and they just laughed. Uh, they they didn't believe it when Lot told them. So, yeah. So when the angels <laughs> and Lot was, you know, Lot was not in any hurry to get out of the town. That's you know, that's he liked the city there. He didn't. He was you know he didn't participate in all their sins, but he he didn't want to move. But they grabbed him by the hand and his wife and his two daughters and nobody else came. All the people he went and told never showed up uh, to, to get rescued. So those sons-in-law perished with the rest of the city. Or, I okay. guess they weren't really son They might have been like engaged to his daughters. I don't know if they were actually, I don't think they were married yet because his daughters were still living in his house. Right. Yeah. And they, and they say, but they did say son-in-law, right? I um, did read that. They were okay. Yeah. 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 So I guess they were pretty well engaged. Okay. And uh, a something else that uh, struck me about uh, the uh, the uh, the city of Sodom, Jesus made the statement that had what was done in the time that Jesus was on the planet, that those people would have repent. If they seen the miracle that Jesus was doing, and 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 is there anywhere where they was warned that they was doing wrong, or they just didn't know no better, you know, mm. uh, you, you know. In other words, most of the time, like the city, uh, uh, but what that uh, probably named uh, the one that got eaten by the whale, the big fish. Uh, they went. Jonah. He was. And okay, in the name of the city that he went to was uh, how you pronounce that? Nineveh. But then they was warned. They was warned of what was be happening, and they all repent. So I'm just wondering uh, 
it, it's tense when I start thinking about Solomon was not warned at all that God would come to destroy him. Is that true? They didn't have no warning at all. Well, I mean, they did have some warning. I mean, uh, you know, when they, they um, uh, the, the two angels came into town and they were, you know, it was like they were just going to stay out in the square all night. Uh, but Lot brought him into his house and gave him dinner. And then I think it was after dinner or something, all the men of the city showed up at Lot's house and said, bring those guys out. And um, so they were going to, you know, have sex with him, uh, which is why homosexuality is called sodomy, because uh, that's what they, they were doing in Sodom. And Lot told him, don't do this wicked thing. You know, these these guys are guests in my house. Um you know, they weren't listening to him. So the two angels had to grab Lot and bring him in the house and shut the door. Uh, they they had a warning, at least that much warning, you know. And, and I don't think, um, well, I don't know how much Lot might have told them all, of, you know, all the time he was living there that uh, that they were doing the wrong thing. I You know, it doesn't, doesn't really tell you. And those angels blind those means. That's know? right. Yeah, they got blinded, right? Okay. Well, great job, man. I just had some question about that Solomon, and I just, you cleared it up. Thank you very much. Great job. Um, I had something to follow up with what um, uh, Mr. Will Credit was talking about, and um, how he brought up the the sons-in-laws and and well, in verse fourteen it says, "Go rush a lot." So a lot rushed out to tell his daughter's fiancés, so they weren't married yet. But I, the big thing that I was thinking about is the fact that it was four people: so Lot, his wife, and then the two daughters. But it was only four people. But if the fiancés would have came, that would have made six people. And earlier, whenever Abraham, um was talking to the the Lord, um it says at least what what does it say in the scripture, at least five, five me at least five righteous people, or is it like five me at least ten righteous people? I can't remember what it says um beforehand, but it's like they couldn't even find five righteous people because lots going around telling all these folks, hey, go um come with me and things like that. And they wouldn't even come. So it's only four presumed people who were willing to follow the instructions that were given and then even though that there was four that were willing to follow only three were willing to follow to completion because as we know Lot's wife turned and looked back at what was going on as well too so I think it's very interesting how like there wasn't any I guess you could say there wasn't that many righteous people in the area So one thing that I I saw uh, was it's like a question, but also like statement, but like just the fact that uh, in Matthew nine thirty six and thirty eight, how you referred, uh, how you pointed to a new leader for talking about the harvest, and then pointing to the new leader in Numbers twenty seven sixteen through twenty one. And seeing how Moses was the leader of God's chosen people, but then he he uh delegated that responsibility over to uh, Joshua, and then I was like, oh Joshua, and then he said Joshua. I was like, wait a minute. So I was like, all right. So we have the law of Moses, and then we also have the uh law of Yeshua, the loving, the righteousness of it. So I was just like, is do those things correlate with each other? Of just how. Moses to Joshua, Yeshua, uh, in like the physical, and then uh, Moses to Yahshua in like the Torah. So that's something that I was thinking about. I think I had a question. Was Yeshua the new leader after Joshua? What? 
I don't know. But yeah, that's just a little uh, learning that I just received. Um, so several things. So I was, I was like the uh, the little boy in Acts, whatever that, whatever that uh, little Acts boy where Paul was was preaching. I had to get resurrected for just a quick second, boy. I, I, <laughs> I woke up like boy, I'm back, <laughs> like I never left. <laughs> It'd be like that. Um, but there's a couple things that um throughout the the teaching that I um had questions about. Uh and just in the very beginning, um it says um uh, something that I'm constantly always looking at is like what is the master doing? What is the master doing? What is important that they're mentioning about what the master is doing? Like we always talk about in some accounts they say this, and some accounts they say this, brother Stevie says. Well, Matthew didn't choose to talk about ripping open the roof, but in another account, they talk about ripping over, open the roof. You know, why is that? You know, <clears throat> uh, could it be placement? Could it be that um, that Matthew wasn't there and he just heard the story, right? Like I know on uh, the chosen, they have him there, but maybe he wasn't. Maybe he just heard the story. Uh, but um, several things happens that has me looking a little deeper is um when it says seeing their faith seeing their faith seeing their faith seeing their faith and like, during you your prayers like open up our eyes and seeing our seeing their faith seeing their faith so then it has me uh, asking what does faith look like is it something to the natural eye? Like we often would say, I know they have faith or they say they have faith or they're a believer, but should faith be something that is seen by someone else? Like, should we be, should either I be able to see faith, not someone's faith, see or seeing their faith? So how then is How do I see faith? Or do I see faith? Does people see my faith? If Yeshua was to walk by me and see me, what the scriptures say, and seeing his faith, or would it be, O oh, ye of little faith? Because he doesn't see anything. We could say a whole lot, but would he see a whole lot? Would the master walk by my life in passing and say, seeing his faith? Um, something else that has me um, it, uh, just good to always hear it is, he says, and, and how I... I it, Outside of Bible studies and biblical talk, it's sometimes hard to remember that the heart thinks. You know, it's hard to always constitute. Most time when people talk about hearts or, you know, about those things, especially because, I mean, there's just a bunch of women around me. It's always talk about how it feels. You know, it's just like how the heart feels like, oh, my, my, you know, I, I'm not loving well. My heart's not doing blah, 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 blah. And my, you know, it's like, you know, I'm doing this with my heart and versus the heart thinking, right? He says, why do you think evil thoughts in your heart? A kind of constant reminders that when we hear the word think, we say I'm overthinking. And I think when we say we're overthinking, 
many times we instantly constitute that as thinking of the mind. But how many times is our heart overthinking of evil? Like constantly just, our heart is constantly thinking evil. Malice and jealousy and, and backbiting and, and vengeance and <clears throat> unforgiveness and, and you know, dissension. And how many times is my heart not overthinking evil? Like, Lord, get these thoughts out of my head. I can't help but to think about it. I don't know. Just this idea of heart thinking always kind of resonates, but it's almost it's, it's almost an oxymoron. It sounds weird, like, outside of, you know, the biblical context. But if I just go down to, like, high V or Target or something, and like, you know, your heart thinking, right? I don't know. It just seems casual. Anyway, um. Another thing, I, I just looked at this uh, this TikTok or Instagram, whatever you call them, reels, story, things, people talking on the interweb, and and one of the people, there was this dude, he was like, he was like crashing out about the name of like, like Jesus. He's like, his name is, doesn't matter what his name is. Like, you know, if I go to this country. And they, my name is Benjamin. They say Ben Hami. I know they're talking to me. Like stop, you know. He's 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 trying to make the point that stop making endless discussions about what his name is. That was his whole point. He got a bunch of people liking it. Lecrae even liked it, <laughs> and I get the heart of it. But it did cause me to think of why are things so easily dismissed to keep on repeating the same solution. Like no one goes back and remembers the day that their mother birthed them. Like, I mean, forgive my my brashness, but, you know, we don't celebrate our parents having sex in our mother's vaginal canal, you know, like, yeah, bless the womb that birthed me into the, you know, like, it, it, like this is the beginning of it, right? Like, the, we had to come into life, and then after life, there's this journeying, right? And it's just like, it's almost like the two different things that that's occurring. It's like we 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 talk about how the gospel it is the gospel, right? The gospel wins souls, and and it's all about the gospel of Christ, one thousand percent, like the loss needs the gospel to come into Christ. But then once we get into him, it's almost like this, you don't have nothing else to, to talk about, like except for that again. And earlier this week, I was having a conversation with somebody. And I said, the New Testament, the Old Testament tell two completely different stories. The, the New Testament really speaks about Yeshua, right? The Old Testament does too, but it speaks about bump that the New Testament really speaks about the ministry of Christ, people doing ministry. Paul's ministry, Peter's ministry. They only talk about what's happening in the ministry, right? You don't know where Paul lived, you don't know where, you know, you don't know Paul's friends, you don't know Paul's shortcomings, you don't know Paul's, you know, his breast stink, you don't know Paul's problems. He mentions it, he alludes to him, but he has problems. You don't know his problems. But in the Old Testament, in Tanakh, it's just all these different accounts of the individual and the families and their lives, not their ministry. So, like, you know about Noah and his wife and, and his problems and his alcoholism and his, you know, his son seeing booty cheeks and, you know, getting, you know, getting all castrate, whatever is, you know, and then we see, you know, about David and all his, you know, baby mama drama and all his wives and all these mothers tripping at Jacob and how deceitful he was and Rachel and Leah and, and how these mothers was jealous and, 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 you know, selling mandrakes for the business, whatever, right? You know, you know, that these, you know, these most was slot, you know, these most was jacked, bro. Like, you like, these most, they give me hope. I feel like, <laughs> yeah, bro, I do that. You know what I'm saying? Like, <laughs> bro, you say no law. Okay. These most are before law. Yeah. This is cool. Give me hope. Cause I'm like, I ain't that bad. Right. 
You know, I ain't selling myself with no apricots. You know what I'm saying? Like, hey, you know, um, these other monks are. All that to say. I know that's a that, that was a whole rabbit. I mean, it, that's don't got nothing to do with what I'm about to say, but whatever. It is interesting that there are things and there are um there are things that are mentioned that I think we overlook and we don't really really investigate why is it mentioned. And one of the things you talked about was the woman with the issue of blood reaching out to the hem of his garment. Like, why so specific, right? So I say that because we go John the Baptist. Why is it necessary for the scriptures to tell us what he wore? In Revelation, why is it important for us to know what Yeshua was wearing? In Genesis, why does it talk about them coming in naked and the Lord covering them? And they did it with fig. Like, so clothing is mentioned through Genesis to Revelation. Food and clothing is mentioned straight throughout the scriptures. Eating a fruit, eating at the table. Stark naked in the garden. Then being clothed in righteousness, you know, by the most high. And then John the Baptist's clothing, Yeshua's clothing. He, he He's in Revelation. And it, it just has me constantly looking at the scriptures like, why are these what seemingly people would say dismiss these little things, dismiss that that's not his name. Who cares what he's wearing? The authors does. The authors, they, they care enough to tell us that there's, there's significance of what this mug had on. There's significance to know what Yochanan the Immerser had on. There's a significance in their name. Like this dude dismissed the name of, of Jesus and Joshua but there's significance in that because, like, even with Shemichael's takeaway, yo, there's some, there's some, that, that shows God's design that Yeshua and the, the position of the, the one who walks us into the promised land came from not the law, but it came from the one who came after the law, which is Yahshua, Yahushua, right? So the Joshua story lines up with Yeshua. It shows them more how they knew that he was the one who took them into the promised land. Yeshua takes us into the promised land. He's the one that's our leader in here. There's some significance to that. So it, it just how arbitrarily like our culture just dismisses things because it's like, it's just about the birth and it's just about the resurrection and the gospel. And that's it. It's like, yeah, you're right. It, it, it is until, it, until it's not, until I need to now know how to walk. Great, I'm born, but now I got to eat. Which goes to my other point is that he says, pray for the workers. If I put on a sign right now that says, now hiring, what's going to be the question? What kind of job? What's the work going to be? What's the pay? So now he says, go find you some workers. In some in certain contexts, we say we're looking for some workers. We talk about some street walkers. She working the night. So the context of... of what am I supposed to be doing? What's the work? And if we say, well, the work is going to church, read your Bible, then these disciples failed. Because, I mean, these monks was going to synagogues, temple that got tore down. They couldn't read. It got to be, what, what, it, what does the Lord of the harvest actually want us to be doing? And are there certain garments that we should, okay, if I'm going to be a firefighter, I better wear some fire retarded clothes. If I'm going to be a painter, I better be having white overalls. If I'm going to be a police officer, I better be badged up. If I'm going to be playing in the NBA or playing in sports, I better have athletic wear on. Sweat resistant. So, I just do not believe that 
some of these details that have withstand language barriers, culture, misappropriation, damage, scrutiny, misuse, blasphemy, all these these scriptures and these descriptions that have made it, we go from Genesis or go from Genesis or even Exodus in the beginning of the writings, seven, eight thousand years for us to be like, yeah, that detail don't matter. Because guess what? Because I said so. We can't we can't write a song right now that's gonna withstand number one top ten for two weeks. You can't have the Michael Jackson days gone, the, the Elvis Presley days are gone, the Whitney the 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 century long or the, the Beatles are done. Like those days are oh, there's no more masterpieces that's gonna withstand the test of time for people's writings. It's so lack of creativity, it's no depth to it. But you got this freaking thousand year book that withstood everything the greatest masterpiece and we flippantly dismiss these details and then want to be like well I don't know how to he gave us freaking instructions let me go ask other stupid people what to do with my stupid self, but have a thousand of these books sitting on my shelf. And don't go ask what I'm supposed to do. What's the work? What does he call the work? This is true. I've came home in certain situations and I may, you know, look at my guys or my girls, or whatever, and they doing something. I'm like, what are you doing? You know, oh, well, you know, you know, good for this tiny. Let me just use tiny, for example. I'll come home and tiny is be doing something. Tiny, what are you doing? Uh, I thought you was tiny. That's not the work I want you to do. Good heart. Good intentions. Same right in all eyes. But it's like, that's not it. That That's not going to benefit. You see? So I, we just, those things become hashtags. But I can't blow over the fact of what does faith look like? Why are they always talking about clothing? What kind of work should I be doing? What does, what does the harvest master say I should be doing? I can't go to LinkedIn and to, you know, Go daddy monster, you know, find a job.com and be like, now hiring. And no one knows what the work is. So, how are we going to pray? Let's say we do pray for workers. Are we going to be able to recognize them if we don't even know what the work is supposed to be? I digress. Next point. Um, the 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 posture of Yeshua tells us to be as shrewd as serpents and as gentle as doves. A couple things about that: the serpent was deceived by Satan, right? Uh, prior to the serpent using his superpowers for evil. His shrewdness was actually beneficial. A shrewd serpent is what you actually want. You want a serpent to be like that's that's the benefit. That's the character of a serpent is to be shrewd and to be cunning and to be wise. Hasetan just took what was good, it was the shrewdness of the serpent, and made it evil to then impact or to influence what was good about a woman. Her carefulness, right? Her serving, like. Think like her service, like her compassion, like her perceived care. Like she took something that she thought was good and served it to Adam, right? And here, here you go. Like that, like 
she could have served him mandrakes or dates or figs or or apples or blueberries or bananas or pomegranates or sapodillis or sugarcane. She could have been bringing this mug, just fruit tray, charcuterie boards or just fruit trays all day long. That just could have been her thing. Like, hey, boo, I got you some more fruit. And he just like, hey, that's what's up. But now here she goes. Now her service to him is like, okay, I know we ain't supposed to or anything, but, you know, the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, it just look real good. I just get cut you a little piece just so you could taste it because I tasted it and it was kind of good and nothing happened. So here you go. Then this dummy hungry, right? He takes it, eats it, hell break loose. It's like, but her serving him was not evil, right? And And the serpents, Cunningness was not evil. So oftentimes it's like we forget that it's a command to be shrewd. He tells those who's following him to be shrewd. Not to be deceiving. Like not to be divisive, not to be evil, not to be malicious, but to be shrewd. Then. I'm about to go ahead and battle rap. They says I'm going ahead and reach. I'm, I'm going to reach on this one. I don't know if this one is, is true, accurate, whatever. But this is what my ears heard tonight. You talk about be as shrewd as serpents and as gentle as, as doves. And you was explaining what doves do. And they, they go out and they look for land, right? And they went, the one who talked about went out, looked for land. He came back to the ark. I think he did it twice, couldn't find it, right? So there's this, this twice happening right of of this dove getting sent out and returning this dove getting sent out and returning this dove getting sent out and then returning when yeshua was getting baptized and it says and the holy spirit fell on him like a dove right was this a picture of him being this dove that went out and will return but did he then take on this dove character from genesis of being sent out right to 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 this new land right it's the picture of peace of shalom like i now i'm i'm seeing the correlation between the authors using and they seen a dove coming down like let's let's put this in this perspective what if that dove that fell on him plucked a piece of his branch and took it back to Noah, right? If time was in the thing, like just this whole idea of Yeshua and the, the Yeshua being the dove of Genesis going down into a place after, you know, the rescue mission that had to happen, he being the, the picture of that, whatever, still working with that, but that's what I got there. And then, um, Yeah, and then something else just wanted to to uh kind of address or just to add to in the in the in the topic or in the conversation when the 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 parishims, the or the Pharisees, the teachers of I don't know if there's a Pharisee, some teachers of religious law, they uh reprimanded Yeshua's disciples for um for uh harvesting grain on Shabbat. You show great picture, great analogy, great that was awesome but it's a big difference between hey man i'm trying to eat and man i'm trying to make this money okay but the one of the things that we in our culture we would not be able to see um is we don't really understand how the disciple actually belongs to the household of the master right like they're they were we call them disciples and learners they got transliterated but hebrew you know talmud even though they were learners they was they was more they were servants they were they were house they belonged to the household they had a master so when the when the teachers of religious law saw them that they were doing something they could they was criticizing they the reason they was criticizing the disciples in and of themselves, but Yeshua was because they was actually criticizing his yoke and his fences, saying your halakha is off. Because if they're doing that, you're teaching them to. And I know that because it's like I know the disciples 
And in my household, it's like they're doing things that is acceptable to my yoke, how I live, how I walk, how I say what I do. So they'll see them and be like, hey, man, why are you most wearing tassels? Whatever. Well, because the master of the home does like, you know, and so what they were doing is they was they was essentially and they were innately they was challenging his halakha they were they were beginning a apologetic dialogue against here is the fruit of your household right here's your christianos or your christianos here's your christ servants your household servants and they're doing harvesting we we respect you as a master as a teacher as a pharisee your halakha or your yoke is off that causes your disciples to stumble and the fence was not only do you not harvest grain or harvest grain on shabbat the fence was you don't even enter into the field so he is just like they're in the field and they're touching it. Why are you even letting them in the field? Like, why are they even so the hand like all those fences have became so 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 ridiculous that they did not constitute the human need of hunger beyond the fence that they put up because Yeshua didn't dispute that it shouldn't be working on Shabbat. He gets it. It's like, no, I agree, they shouldn't be working. They're not working, bruh. These Moses, they're addressing human need. But they were just saying, like, why are they even in the field to begin with? He's like, so you just want them to die, huh? Wow. Like, yeah, you real righteous. So you're gonna do what you're gonna, you're gonna come against was, and then he flips it back on. He's just like, man, he refers them back. He's like, so the innocent ones. He's like, you're gonna condemn the innocent ones? The ones that have no guilt, you are ascribing, and boy, we all guilty of this. We are ascribing guilt to someone based off of our standard and not according to the standard of love. Or even in this case, even the standard of law, we are ascribing guilt. He's like, they're guilty because I say so. Like, they're 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 not they're not innocent. They're blank. They are. He says they are without guilt. They're blameless. They're right. They are without guilt. Why are you ascribing guilt to the blameless? And now, what are they doing that's wrong? Well, you know, the law says. Yeah, the law says they're not doing that. And then th this is my last thought, then I'll rest. Um, also, another thing that you brought up tonight that I never, never really considered or thought about. And I'm like, man, that has to be incredibly fascinating. Had to be weird. Like one of the most, you can imagine, I don't know, one of the most interesting or perhaps one of the most amazing or mind-blowing um, scenario settings, I would say settings that is alluded to in the scriptures. It doesn't explicitly say it, but it's alluded to in the scriptures. Has to be the pregnancy and the birth of Cain. Like, with, like how amazed did Adam and each or Adam and at that time Eve had to be when they finally brought forth a male out of the heat out of the, the the feminine body the whole like the contractions the the head pushing the 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 the, the belly getting expanded and getting like and they're watching this thing that they may have seen with animals but it's like there is a freaking human coming out of her like out of there <laughs> what like
because you talk about what his name mean, like, you know, Cain or Kana and, and the creator. And like they had to hold that thing in blight. Flick that mug, smack that mug, doing all this thing that this little, with this whole rope on this mug, like all loopy and like, they know the angels have to come down and walk them through that one. I'm sorry, we, and listen, I don't got the book. I'm going to Enoch or Jasher. I, I bet you, they ain't no way, they ain't no way they would have known what to do. Adam, he dumb enough to eat a fruit. He had no idea what to do in that situation, none. She hollering, she pushing this thing about her. He's like, oh yeah, no, nah, wait a minute, time out. Oh, I can't compete with that. Think about it. Think about. It. I'm just telling you that first pregnancy had to be wild, bro. How long did Cain stay attached to her? Like, you know, like she, <laughs> like, dang, is this mother gonna leave me alone? Like, you know, what I'm saying, like, I don't know, I don't know. I'm just asking, just asking. But it didn't dawn on me until I'm like, what would have what would have been amazing or what would have been creative about Cain was the first freaking baby. This mug, I got 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 goo goo got got me doing all this other crazy stuff. I bet he was chunky too. Maybe not. I mean, it's a fruit. Bottom line. They don't got no YouTube to watch. They can't use no chat GPT and no AI or Alexa or Siri to play. Hey, what am I supposed to do with this thing? They had to be amazed. Had to be amazed. Again, once again, those accounts that we just, and he knew his wife and had sexual relations and then they bore them a son. Let's go back to that bore them a son part. I'm gonna digress because I feel myself getting about to about to take this other places. I forgot we'd be recorded. Recent person, I would have said some stuff about anyway. I'm done. Ain't that crazy though? Just something about. See what you said about like the the motherhood. I mean the the pain being birthed. Like they didn't have like no parenthood on like how to parent this kid. It's just like it would have been like natural for them. Like the the protection side came or out no there. anesthesia, bruh. <laughs> Talk about pain. What? <laughs> so it's just like that protection side for, of Adam on that providing side of Adam, like would have came out naturally. And like the nurturing side and the gentle side would have came out and Eve naturally. And it's just like, that's how God created them. That's how we are, are created. So. Man, you think that mug grabbed it by the head and tried to hurt him? Like, you know, she hollered. You think he just tried to yank that thing out? I don't know. You know what I'm saying? Like, I'm oh, making why you, you know, when he thought it was stuck. You know what I'm saying? Uh, who knows? Uh, angels came down. Some Somebody did. Now, kids that that came and helped them. That's what it was. The Lord said, hey, bro, move over. I got this. Let me let me show you. I know the Lord had to walk Adam through. He probably had it for Abel. Nah, I the Lord pulled down and helped Cain on the first one. I mean, hell, he, he helped Adam on the first one. I'm convinced. Whatever. And they didn't know book, but I will. Well, well, there y'all go. Y'all run with it. Yeah. And, like, I'm thinking about, like, raising that child. And that mug ain't speak none of the language. You like, bro, what do I do with this thing? Like, that mug don't walk. That mug don't talk. You just look at that like. He a bum, bro. He can't work. He can't work. He's a bum. Like, you're supposed to be a whole human. It's going to take you 18. Bro, why is it taking you two years to walk? You got work to do. Work to do. Oh, I'd be mad. Also, so I just got to wait. I thought he's supposed to be a help. This mug can't even walk. Just think weak. about it. The other human guy gave him was a whole person. Whole human woman. <laughs> he's like, what is this little thing? Just, just there. Just eat it. <laughs> Trying and pooping. Probably didn't have no clothes to fit him. No, nah, them came out naked. They're like, oh. just naked. 
<laughs> anyway, I'm, I'm done. I'm all... You you know, uh, when I look at the animals, they don't they don't have nobody training them what to do with the kids. And and I watched them have kids. Eve could have just pushed this child out. But in animal, pain. animals too. Think about how many, how fast does it take an animal to get walking and taking care of itself pretty quick? The human species takes a much longer time. The animals come out, a deer could come out shaking them up walking in a little bit. The animals also get to, to their strength a whole lot quicker than human, at least in today's world, right? I mean, I don't know what, like you bright, bright credit. I don't know what's the, but if we go on the natural course of life, humanity takes a whole lot longer to become capable for themselves than these animals. And it, it, and you're right, there's, they probably would have learned a lot from these animals if they had to watch them and what to do with them. The animals could have been a good teacher to them. That, that's, that does make a lot of sense. But you, you know, some animals are born and they blind. They can't even see. They, they, but how do they know how to go to the, uh, to get milk, you know? I mean, they, they just know how to find it. They just, the mother sat down and they blind, but they know how to find that nipper, you know? So Adam and Eve was much smarter than the animals, but it's still something to think about. He had questions when he seen it come out though, for sure about that. He had questions. Is it gonna to return to its normal state? That, I mean, that would be a question, but. Um, I, yeah, those are, those would be some questions. But something I was also thinking, like while you were saying that, I was wondering that when she went into birth and how painful it was. Did she remember what God? Did she remember what God told her about her her pregnancy being painful? You know. Because he told her before she even was pregnant with Cain, or even would have known what that was, that you you was going to experience a painful uh, pregnancy. And in that moment when she became pregnant with pain with Cain and gave birth, would she had would she have thought, oh, this is pregnancy? I don't know, just a thought. And then also um, when Cain was born, and he was born naked, would Adam and Eve have thought back to when they didn't have, would they have seen their self naked from the beginning and then having to clothe Cain? And would they have realized that in that moment, would they have realized the severity and the realness of what they, what they lost in the pureness, in their pureness of God, when they had to take that baby and that was naked and born pure, you know, uh, excuse me, and then had to actually put a covering over over top of him. I don't know, just a just a thought when you were talking. Um, my takeaway was um, when we were going over the uh, when Yeshua was saying like the harvest is plentiful but laborers are few um, I just got more understand more understand of like what does it mean to be uh, a laborer and uh, even in the analogy with me I was like dang like do I how much do I do that? Like, how much do I try to do something for the Lord? And I don't even ask, like, questions, or I don't even, like, uh, seek, like, what does he want me to do? Or at least seek for understanding. But, um, yeah, 
I had another thought, but this was okay. Um, whenever it comes back to me, I'll let you know. But that was one of my takeaways. It uh, came back to me. Um, so the, the the last thought I had was just like, um, I remember when Brother Steve was saying like, uh, just in that story, um, Jesus' disciples was uh, asking him like, uh, well, Jesus was telling his disciples to pray for more laborers. And then right after that, he set them up. So, um, I just learned, like, as I'm um, praying for more laborers, as I'm praying for other people to do God's work, um, just be ready to go do more work as well in the meantime while they're coming in. Yep, that's all I got. Um, I had an actual takeaway. Um, whenever it says in Matthew where it says, are you the Messiah we've been expecting or should we keep looking for someone else? It's like John the Baptist and these other folks were like, had sort of some sort of like expectation for what the Messiah would look like. Um, like it was like, are you the person that we thought you were going to be? Or should we look for somebody else? Like, like should we should we look for some? Should we keep on looking for what we want? And then Jesus respond, go back to John and tell him that what you have heard and seen. Um, the blind see, the lame walk, those with leprosy are cured, the deaf hear, the dead are raised to life, and the good news is being preached to the poor. And he added, God blesses those who do not fall away because of me. Um, that verse six was always interesting to me. I never really understood that. But um, it was just interesting that it's like John, the one who's supposed to be welcoming in the Messiah, and he's like, this man's greater than me, and he proclaims all these things about Yeshua. It, even him, he's like, hey, are you the guy who I expected you to be? Like, you're not doing the things that I thought you were supposed to do. So are, are, are you really the guy, or should we look for somebody else? So I just kind of thought that was just interesting, um, the way that John poised that question. I never really thought about it that much. I don't know if we've talked about this before, uh, Keys. Um, <clears throat> a lot of that uh, was dealing with um, timing, frustration, and what they had just, I don't know if we talked, remember, they, they had just got the time of the Maccabees. And you had that they spent all those times during the Maccabees protecting the Torah. So they just start having like they the synagogues came and and the zealots came and and the the and they start to protect and they finally <clears throat> got to the value of where it's like we've done everything that we needed to do at this point. We're protecting the Torah because remember the word gospel, how we use it was not a word that they was really expecting. Like, that's not a, we say it's all about the gospel. I mean, let me make sure I frame it as well. That's not an Old Testament word that we see, right? It's like the good news, right? It's really, if it could be properly translated, comma, it would probably be like, it's, it's a finally happening prophecies that's like it's the fulfilled prophecies coming right like gospel could be fulfilled prophecies or is the prophecy being fulfilled 
right? Like that's the good, like that's what's happening. It's the good news. It's that happening. We see more good news now because of like obviously the the European influence, Latin influence, and then some of those things are going back and being tried. Like this is the gospel of Jesus. This is the good news. This is the account. This is, but really, it would have been a fulfillment of anticipation, right? Everybody was on the edge of their seats waiting for something to happen, and they knew that at some point that the Torah or the prophecy was that that Israel was going to be restored, right? That Israel was going to take his rightful place among God. And the thing that spoke the most about this was the Torah. So during time of Maccabees, when they was trying to get rid of the Torah and they finally protected it from the world power, they're like, yeah, we we got it. No, it we, we kept it. Yeah, the, the army, you know, the tribes, we we kept it and we secured it. And and John the Baptist is out there saying, I don't want to celebrate nothing. Don't give me no steak. Don't give me no wine. I don't want to wear no garments. It don't matter. I'm living dead. Why? Because I'm the one. I know he's come. Why? We did our we did our final task. We kept the tour whole and we protected it and we're ready to go. And now it's coming. And now the Messiah is coming to restore Israel. And John the Baptist, there are some schools of thought that believe that he was in a grievance when he's just like, are you the one coming? And some other schools of thought believe he was in a moment of celebration because, again, you could literally live John the Baptist's life and set it into the Old Testament. He was the final prophet. He was the last prophet to die. Why? Because he was the one. Well, did Isaiah say there's ones crying in the wilderness, behold the lamb of Hashem, right? Like he, he, he knew he was announcing it and he knew every prophet is dying. Every prophet is about to get killed. They wasn't jihadists, but they were, they were, they were definitely martyrdom in spirit. So John is like, I'm getting ready to get chopped up. Just like all the other prophets. Hey, This is it, right? This is it, ain't it? You you the one, right? I don't need to tell my disciples to wait for nobody. <laughs> I'm, I'm on death row, cuz. Like, you know what I'm saying? I'm on death row. Got thug life on my chest. Like, like two, I'm ready to go. I'm are you the one? So I could tell, I could give them their proper exit Hey, don't even trip. I'll be back a couple of days. Why? Because I'm going to be among the resurrection of the dead. Messiah's here. So some of that conflict with, with him was like the scene was set. You know, it's like, I don't want to use that analogy with you, but it's like you walk into the house. Everything's smelling good. The plates is on the table. The knife and the fork is there. The, the, the juice and the wine is all laid out. The bread is cut. The, the turkey's sitting in the middle. And, and, you know, everybody's standing around the table. And he said, come in and wash your hands. It's time to eat, ain't it? And John is like, it's the, it's the, no, it ain't time to eat. We still waiting. But it's full about to get cold, man. You better come. You, you, like it, it's some it's some of that scenario was going on as well, too. It wasn't necessarily like, yeah, he was a little condescending and he was a little, you know, a, a, you know, abrasive against the Messiah. But you gotta understand, ain't none of us been on death row. So we, you know, it's quick to condemn. Ain't none of us about to be like, yeah, some little hussy about to get my hair chopped off because she, you know, twerked it back that thing up on, on some of Harris folks. Now, my hair about to get chopped off because ain't none of us experienced that. So there was this contention going on, but some of that contention was also based off of anticipation, like, uh, that, that I'm, I'm it, like <laughs> I'm it, bro. 
But just not like I, I fulfilled it. I know John knew he fulfilled the Isaiah prophecy. He knew he did. So the good news is right. The, the, the you the next you you up. Like you're not about to let them destroy Israel. Like no, you're about to restore Israel, ain't you? Because they didn't understand what we get the privilege of seeing is that he came and conquered death, not just the natural world, right? Like that's in the second. But if you think about it, for those that's a Messiah now, that's what we anticipated. We we sitting there waiting for the new Jerusalem, which begs the question. How many of us are going to be disappointed if it ain't what we think it is? We thinking, oh, he's going to come and, you know, be heaven on earth. And, and you know, it's going to be one new earth and it's going to be these things. That's what they prophecy said. So could you see why the Orthodox could look at us and be like, hey, bro, our, our book says that it's going to be restored. Is we not restored yet? Why would I believe your Messiah came? Like, I can't believe that, that Jesus is the Messiah. Why would I believe that? Because our book that y'all say he came from says this is happening, so it's the spiritual lens. So now for us to play, oh, we're waiting for the second coming of Christ because Revelation says he's going to come with a horse and something like that. If he comes and he come and chilling, and be like, yeah, you just misunderstood the, the metaphor. But we're like, nah, bro, wait a minute. I'd be down here having to deal with glitchy Wi-Fi and not having my temperature controlled room everywhere that I go, and I still have to put gas in my car. Like, I'm not living this hard life. You know, my steady income. No, I'm I'm ready to get up out of this hellhole. And he's just like, yeah, no, that's not what it is. Like, I have not seen nor has heirs heard, or nor has it entered to the hearts of man the things that God had prepared for them. We don't know. The heroes that we see in the scriptures, ain't nothing lavish about their life, but we, 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 got, we have an idea of, we have a perception of a lavish future. And I'm not saying we wrong. All I'm saying is I, understand, I, could even, I can't even imagine what John was going through. Because us saved now, still so like, did God really say? Right, we do that. I can't believe God would do that. Why would God want to do that? Well, God, why are you going to, you know, and it be because we busted our toe. You so mean, why I got to hit my toe bone? You know. Thank God, I don't got $50,000 in the bank. I need it tomorrow. Lord. Have mercy on me, yo. You know, stuff like that. Yeah, uh, that makes a lot of sense. But some that you were saying towards the beginning have um, about the restoration of the Torah with the Maccabees and how they, well, the, the preservation and restoration reminds me a lot of like Moshe Moses. It's like, okay, Torah is established. And then Yeshua, so Joshua came from Moses and brought literal, like them to the promised land. And then it's like, okay, we got our Torah intact. Like Moses got the Torah intact. Where's our Joshua? So Yeshua is that Joshua. So it's like, it's still going back to the whole Exodus story. There's the whole, to not, the, the, to, the whole Torah story of we were here, we were in captivity, I'm saying the, the silent period. We got our Torah, I'm saying, got our Moses, got our Torah. And now it's like, okay, where's our leader? That's not, um, where's our leader that's going to have us in this land type of thing? And that's Yeshua. But everybody's like, wait a minute, where, where's the, the physical, like the, like the first guy did. The first guy got us physical land and physically restored us, whereas Yeshua is all spiritual and things like that. Exactly, yeah, Absolutely. I also wonder what was in John's mind myself, see. I was like, 
man, I know I'm finna die. Right? And I ain't, and I haven't done nothing wrong. That I can't find no scripture that say, because even Jesus bragged about John, right? And and now here John ain't did nothing. And now I'm finna die. And I know this is what I supposed to do. Uh, man, it, it's I mean, being a disciple of Christ is is a uh, it's not it's not nothing to play with. Right, it, this this is not a joke, because even even today, when we go out into the world and tell people about Yeshua, you know, it's such a research to get our head chopped out. It, it it might be coming to that, you know. Uh, this world is getting so wicked now, you know, and evil. And and when Jesus was talking in the Book of Acts, the disciples even asked him. Will you not restore the kingdom back to Israel? So they were looking for a physical kingdom, and Jesus was talking about a spiritual kingdom. Okay. So making sense. And, and, and then also, when you look at Peter being a coward, and then once he realized that Jesus had came back, and that, hey, I'm not a coward anymore. Peter, Peter, didn't, Peter didn't take no mess after that. Right? right. And and you was the one that taught me about the doubting Thomas. <laughs> Man, I get everybody with that. <laughs> I, I I I wait for them to say Thomas was doubting. No, no, bro. <laughs> Thomas, Thomas was not doubting. Yeah. Thomas was doing what anybody else would do. Man, don't play with me. You know, I I was out doing something, and y'all telling me he don't came back. He was not. So when you got to really read this Bible. And dig out the treasures that's in it, you know. It it, it that don't come through osmosis. You got to really study it, you know. And yeah. Thank you for that though, because now I, I I once again I still don't know how John failed, right? But but I but I know how real credit would have failed. That's you know? real. That's and real. I've been saying, let's try to do this. Like Jesus felt the same way. <laughs> hey, let's can this cup pass from me? When he was getting ready to put a die and go to the crowd, he asked the father, "Can you can you do this another way?" You know, yeah. Thanks, big. Yeah, of course, man. Thank you. That was good. Some of my takeaways, a lot of questions. Um, and thoughts. Um, you're saying the heart thinks. The verse that says, out of the, as man thinketh in his heart, so he is. Um, and you're saying, like, in day to day life, that's like you said, pulling up to high your target. That's not something that you just be like, the heart thinks. Um, but now I'm hearing that, so I'm thinking about the hard things as I'm like working with my kids. Like, the hard things. Um, and you also said something like you talk, you hit on a lot about like the the humanity of people, kind of just like that's just their nature. Um, and we ascribe guilt to the blameless. Um, another thing was, um, what does faith look like? And then I was like, do our clothes have anything to do with our faith? And then it made me also think about how in other cultures or other religions, or things like that, you can see or kind of put them in like a box, like you either with this or you with that based off of what they have on. Um, but heavy on like, what does our faith, what does faith look like? Um, and then also we can, I never looked at the story of um, Adam and Eve and the eating of the fruit and like looking at it as like, this was the first woman and 
with that, there's some natural instincts in there that are good, like her servanthood. Um, good point. I'm like, we always, like, yeah. I always, she was a helper. Yeah. That the scriptures give descriptions. Um, and then I was wondering, like, well, what does Cain mean? Like the first human. I don't know if that's what it means, but I was like, what does Cain mean if he, if he was the first human? Um, and then the like, it's so interesting to take the time to read the scriptures. Like you notice things like they weren't harvesting on Shabbat. Then you said that it was more so about them being in the fence in the first place. It's like never would I have thought any of that. Like it's about you being in the fence. The law says, let's not even go over there. You guys are over there. Not only are they just having a conversation about that, but they're challenging his household um, or his like mastery, which was like, but then also like to challenge it means that you see me as a master. So, like, that's deep, just in that way. Um, Run that last statement back. You said to see what as a... To challenge his master means that you see him as a master mm-hmm. in the first place. Um and then I was gonna I was thinking gentle as a dove and shrewd as a serpent. I've posed the question in my head, like, oh, what does that mean? But never have I been like, well, what does a dove do? Um, let's look at the thing that he said it would be. Um, that's okay. But yeah, he's like, well, let's pay attention to some doves. And then um, Brother Steve was giving examples of like things that they do. Um and then you brought up a point of like, or a question of like Yeshua as a dove, question mark, comma. Now I'm like, what does a dove do? That's right. How like, and then your original point or one of your points was just like, how quick are we to write off things that, the details and things. Um, and then also like the difference in like, it added commas into like how I see um, the Old Testament versus the New and the New Testament. Like in the Old Testament, there are stories, there are details of people's lives and feelings and emotions and all these things like that. In the New Testament, they trash. <laughs> in the New Testament, it's just ministry and how they're walking on earth, not just, but like you do lose kind of some of that. Um, so it's like we understand you're a human, but the ministry, you know? Um, yeah. So a lot of good things. A lot of good things. And the heart things. That is so interesting. So um shalom um for me what i heard um was be shrewd as a serpent and be gentle as a dove and then like looking at like what is it like what did doves do and how like the dove on noah's ark like it was there and then it was sent out, then it was a return. It was there, then it was sent out, then it returned, then it got sent out. Um, that's really interesting. And like this is a question like, did you sure do that? Um, and then also too, like I had a question, like, where do we see Yeshua be shrewd? Like, what does that mean? Everywhere it talks about him slipping away. Uh, even the account where he was supposed to go to Sukkot and he told his brothers he did not Yeshua Yeshua lied. All right, there it is. Boom, I said it. He's uh, his brother says, Hey, why don't you go to uh Sukkot and show you a little power? He's like, nah, bro, I'm chilling, bro. I'm cooling. I'm not gonna go to Sukkot. And it says as soon as he left and he got him, he's like, psych, I'm going. And he went. But he said that he was there. Um, it was there like as a ninja, like he was like incognito because he's like he didn't want nobody to know. He's like because they knew the, the religious leaders was looking for him. So he's like, he he, you know, he just juked them all. So he didn't. And then the other time he was in the temple and he's just like, Man, for real, like your whole set sucks. And he's like, What? And they tried to pick up rocks. And they said he, he slipped out in the back, like, you know, he's got up out of there, you know. And then, bro, to walk on water, bro. You know how 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 like bro, how chill you gotta be to be able to walk on water, like. We'll just and then like when he be retreating they're like where did he go and where did he go like it happens all the time he'd be just dipping out or then most would say something like he would say he would say like these little this little he he condescended but he'd be like um like oh this one like, oh can you bless me he'd be like should i give to you what belongs to the kids 
dog, you know? And she's like, yeah, but dogs get crumbs. And he's like, all right, you right. And he's like, here's your blessing. But like, he he's always, so he'll say, he'll say, so why did you say this? And he'll be like, well, I'll answer you if you answer me. Well, who gave Mo Moses the power? And he'll be like, dang, he got me again. So he's always like doing these little, these little Jedi mind tricks with people like, phew, like they couldn't get him, you know? They they couldn't get her. He like it's dope. Like it's look at his like countenance, bro. With these people, like he's like he's. I mean, he's. I'm gonna say he's rude, but <laughs> like man, he's not Iowa nice. I'll tell you that. Like you know, he ain't he 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 don't got no PR skills. You know, like he he is not fan favorite. Like you have to be like you have to be. Like, bro, your tongue had to hurt if they're going to kill an innocent man. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, he literally said stuff. Like, he told his mama, why are you looking for me? Like, bro, you 13. I wish Jocka would say, why are you looking at me? Yeah, all right. I would lump that mug head. Like, that's why I'm looking for you, boo. You know? But he didn't. He's just like, I'm by my... And then he says something slick. You know, I'm by my father's business. And no, Mary probably like, oh, so you're going to hit me with that one. Like, what's she going to do with that? She can't whoop it. And Joseph, like, hey, I'm not fooling with that. You know, I don't need Hashem coming on me. You know, yo, daddy told you to be here with him. <laughs> hey, Marion, we got to roll. I mean, hey, I don't know what to tell you. I'm out of here, right? And then he just disappeared. Because he's like, I can't do nothing with this kid. Because, like, my feelings is hurt. I mean, I know, you know, like, I'm his stepdaddy. Like, you know what I'm saying? Like, dang, he was intimidated by, by Mary's baby daddy. Like, bro, what am I supposed to do with this? You know what I'm saying? So he's true. All the time. Just look at his conversations. He always like, dude, it's so slick. Like, hey, bro, like, how you think of that? You know, like, how you be thinking about that? But look at his conversations. You'll see him being, fum, fum, you know, he'll be juking them mugs. I I give you a great example. You know the time that they caught and invited Jesus to a Sabbath day meal. And Jesus sat down at the meal and they put this man in front of him that had uh, dropsies or something like that to see what Jesus healed him. And they and they say, okay, you're not supposed to heal on the Sabbath. And Jesus said, okay, then I'm going to show you how screwed I am. What if one of your kids fell into a well or your oxen fell into a well? What would you do? Shut up. Screw, man. Very screw. <laughs> That's a good one. That's a good one. He always put them in a situation where he's more cunning than them. He's more wise and he's more wittier than them. He's like, yeah, you could say this, but he, he, what about that? And they're like, dang, you know, like all those conversations are very, very, by definition, are very cunning, are very shrewd. He eludes the traps, right? If you ever put, he's just eluding the traps. He's just like, uh-uh. Nah, you try to put me in this trap, fiend, fiend. You know, like you can't. It's like they set a trap. Mm -mm. He, 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 another trap. <laughs> right? He's constantly ducking and dodging these traps, but he's doing it just like stealthily, like this, like move your body, like you know what I'm saying. Like he's probably a bad song, but y'all know what I'm saying. Like a snake, like a serpent, like real kind of deal. So hopefully that helped, Jonathan. It did. Thank you, sir. Um, my takeaway was really a lot of what you just said. Like, you should be cooking. Like, that was that was funny just to think about it, put in that perspective. Like, he he really did have an attitude. And I, I don't know, that would have been so funny to see in person. Um, but one of my takeaways was um, Brother Steve was talking about uh, he made a remez back to Sodom and Gomorrah and how they were just judged for their wickedness in their town. And then he talked about Jonah as well. And it brought to mind Nineveh um, and how we often, when reading the Jonah story, like I always just think about Jonah, but I'll never think about Nineveh and the city that did repent. And I listened to the prophet and then turned from their wickedness. So I thought that was very interesting. Um, as well as just the different animals that I got to hear about as well. as like the serpent and the dove and seeing the shrewdness of the serpent and then just the, the qualities of what the dove does. 
um, and just seeing more about how we can just learn through nature and the animals that he's presented. Um, also, thinking about thinking with your heart or saying in your heart and not necessarily like feeling from the heart. That was really interesting as well. It was like, yeah, there is so much evil that comes just out of my mind and not like necessarily my heart. Like I'd be thinking it. I don't really be feeling it, but I don't know. It's a weird thing. But yeah, that that's mine. Okay. Um, my takeaways, one, uh, you definitely brought in a new perspective with the dove, because I was thinking uh, about the dove, um, like, and representing Holy Spirit. Um, and, like, is there a similar, like, circling that happens, like, going to look for somewhere to land, can't find anywhere, go back? Um, like, is that kind of what happens with the heart? Like, is rock looking for somewhere to land, like, looking for a heart that's ready? Like, is the heart the land? But that's what I was thinking about. Um, and then uh, – with the Genesis 49 10 reference where it talks about Judah ruling until Shiloh comes. Who is Shiloh? <laughs> what is Shiloh? I don't I have no clue whatsoever. Um and then um when you were talking about uh what is the master doing and then later on you said um like what work should what work should I be doing? Um, and then it made me think like, is it similar or is it the same work that the master is doing? Um, and then like in John 17, when he's praying, I was looking, it might not be in John 17, but at some point before he even gets to the cross, he says that a work is complete. And like, is that the work that we're supposed to be taking on now? Because obviously we can't take on the cross. Um, I ain't trying to, <laughs> um, but the work that he, um, finished at that point, like, is that the work for us to do? Um, and then we were talking about like, what is our faith or what does my faith look like? Do I see faith? Um, do others see my faith? Like that's a, yeah, that's a good heart question. You you were saying that you sure was supposed to go to Sukkot? I spelled it how I thought I heard it. Was was that what you're saying, Sukkot? I can't hear you. Pig, you're muted. Oh. Okay, yes. S U K K O T Sukkot, or it could be uh, the Feast or Festival of Tabernacles or the Feast mm -hmm. of Booths. They're all the same. And that was a time where they did Aliyah or a walk with God to Jerusalem. And I believe it was Sukkot. Now, it wasn't Passover. It wasn't Shavuot. It wasn't, yeah, I think I believe it was the Festival of Booths or the Festival of Temple or Tabernacles or Sukkot. They're all the same. And I was uh, thinking about this. I mean, a lot of what you said here, but the one that's uh, going to mention here is that what does it look like? What does faith look like? And, uh, um, you know, like he, he saw faith when he saw certain things. Um, other people saw, what are you doing? You know, <laughs> this is inconvenient, you know, but he, he saw faith, you know, so that, you know, I need probably need some adjustment to my eyes. Yeah, I, I've been thinking a lot about this lately because I mean, like, I have the conversations, and I, you know, share with people like, yeah, who do you resonate with most in the Bible? And I, you know, that's never a New Testament character because, like, I don't know their life. I just know their ministry. It's just like whatever. So I'm like, I like think about Abraham and Noah, and and these were most that was called friends of God, righteous men. These was holy men. Moses was humble. Like I call these people righteous. 
you know, like he caught and what did he do? Like this mug is in the middle of a desert building a boat. He looked ridiculous, bro. Like that is ridiculous. Like, what are you doing? I like your words, inconvenient. It, it, it's it's it, it's psychotic. It it, it it really it you it, it's irrational. It's a waste of resource. It's a waste of life. You're wasting your life, Moses. Why are you out in the wilderness for forty years? Like, what are you doing? And why are you walking with these these troubled people for forty years to get to year thirty nine? And you can't even go in. Abraham, why are you leaving your father's house? Like, wh wh where are you going? Like, what do you mean? Like, bro, you are a 50-year-old man. Why are, you, why are you putting a flint knife to your genitalia, bro? What's, wait a minute. Wait, wait, wait a minute. Hold up, brother. Wh what you doing? I know this mug did not take my baby up to to no mountain to go, right? Like, yeah, God God told me to. You know what I'm saying? I just got to be obedient. You know, God told me to take her something. Like, what? Like, they got to look to it. Faith got to smell to it. Faith got, it got a vibe. Faith got a vibe, bro. And some of these things, people say they got faith. It don't be vibing. Like, your faith don't buy. Big, you know, that was a, in James, James said he'll show you his faith by his work. Works, that's right. right. And, that's and right. So, so, so you can confess something, because God might tell you in your heart that he wants you to do this, but if you don't do what God say you're supposed to do, uh, you ain't got nothing with God. You know, that's you can right. talk all you want. Com they like they used to say that Chris Dennis was a great confession. Keep on confessing and don't do, and see, <laughs> he don't finna get nothing from God. That's okay? true. Because that lady that you just spoke about at that came in Jesus. So I never seen such great faith even in uh Jerusalem. That's right. This lady, yes, this lady say, hey, you know, <laughs> she, she was true. She said, hey man, even the dog eats the crumb. That's right. And Jesus said, "Wow, come on, baby, what you what you want? Your that's daughter right. is here, you know." She showed her face. She didn't give she, up. That's right. She showed it. He saw it. Yeah. Like he saw something. Yeah. Because she took the blow of humiliation, of rejection, everything that and all y'all women could attest to that. Public humiliation, embarrassment, insecurity, rejection. She took that mug on the chin. He was like, yeah. Sarah Phoenician, so she's a Gentile. She ain't even supposed to be talking to no Jewish man. Mug could have, dog there could have got her head beat, for, like for, like facing danger. Oh, dog, I'm, I'm afraid of rejection. No, she was afraid of getting her, her tail whooped. And she took it on the chin. It's like, nah, bro. Like, I see, I see who you are. I see what you can do. She took, yeah, but then he's, he's like, dang, you took that on the chin? Okay. Yep. Like, that's some stuff. So, yeah, what does it look like, man? What does mine look like? Like, man, if, if it don't look like something I could explain tangibly, it probably don't exist. <clears throat> yeah, well.
Okay, well, everybody good? Anybody got some more to add here? All right, let's maybe, uh, let's have a prayer and uh, we'll close it down here. Um, Father, thank you for uh, just allowing us to um, once again just come together and uh, learn more about you. Uh, thank you for everything that you've revealed to us tonight. Um, and Father, um, I pray that you will just continue to remind us um, as we go about our day, um, as we go on about doing your work. Um, and we thank you for everything that you've done and everything that you're going to do, and everything that you're even doing right now while we're here. Um, yeah, we pray all this in the name of your Son, Yeshua the Messiah. Amen. Amen. Thank Amen. you, brother. Amen. All right. All right. See you guys next week. Shalom. 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 Shalom.